few steeply pitched turns tied together with long stretches of sunbaked pavement. Add a handful of bright colored cars and all but take flight under the gun. Once a regional sport, NASCAR has become big business, rich, controversial, and sexy. From Daytona International Speedway, welcome to ESPN Ultimate NASCAR, The Dirt. I'm Jerry Punch, and in this show, we'll take a fresh look at NASCAR's early years. You know, these days, billions of dollars are generated by a loyal TV fan base. But as the old timers would say, the sport now known as NASCAR was born of the soul on the hard packed dirt roads of the South. <laughs> Racing started, it was entirely dirt track. The cars would go around the track, you know, twice, and everybody who was there would be covered with this dust, particles of mess. You'd see them come by, and, they'd, and most of them would have, or a lot of them would have a cigar, a big cigar in their mouth, but they weren't smoking, they were just breathing through that cigar. The dust was so bad, and that cigar was filtering out the dust, see? They wore jeans and t-shirts for a long time. They wore open face helmets. They didn't even bother to wear goggles. I mean, they didn't have the safety net in the door. It was just, it's a completely different thing. To look at the sport today and compare it to its early days, it is night and day. The sun coming up. Jim, you got enough in here for scrambled eggs? I'll make a little more gravy. Oh, okay. The morning sun has barely touched the Carolina countryside. Pork bellies hiss and sputter. Call it old-fashioned southern hospitality from a stock car pioneer. There you go, guys. Boys come by friends of ours all day long, and they you know, if we're not here, they'll just look in the oven and get them something to eat and go on, you know. Who needs a little bit of dib of coffee? Anybody? <laughs> Give you the old. <laughs> That's good. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Stock car racers were part of that last group of, of natural-born American heroes, uh, and that Junior Johnson at that time was the outstanding one. I, well, I think you make your luck a little bit in racing, you know. If you determine and work at it hard enough and stuff. Now, right here comes the man. Yeah. He, he, he's the one that controls it all. Look at it. Look at it. <laughs> Junior was the kind of the ultimate good old boy. Come on, guys. Everything was open arms when you went by his place. He wore those bib overhauls, you know. That's all he wore was them bib overhauls. And walk, you know, talk slow. And, you know, he's very sociable. I had been driving on the dirt road at 14, 15, 16 years old, something. and I, I, was, I learned how to handle a car very, very well. As a driver, Junior Johnson earned 148 top tens and won 50 cup races. As a car owner, he's captured six Winston Cup championships. His style, a bulldog confidence veiled by a cool country drawl. Seen him win many, many races where he outsmarted uh, the competition because he he just had that right gray matter that just uh, fit into racing real well. Junior could drive dirt, he could drive pavement, he could drive short track, he'd drive long track. He wants to lead every lap from start to finish. He is a brilliant businessman, he is a brilliant car mechanic, he was a brilliant driver. I mean, there are very little that Junior can't do that Junior doesn't do spectacularly well. When I was a young boy, my dad had a farm, and uh, he basically grew stuff for the family, like corn and wheat. He uh, farmed basically to keep his family alive. He also used the excess of each to make moonshine. 
Homemade whiskey, distilled in the hills. Moonshine, backcountry swill, bottled and sold, bootleg. Untaxed and illegal. Junior Johnson probably embodies the, the whole story of NASCAR because he's a guy who has the, the clear-cut ties to uh, moonshine running, do, has never denied them, has never really apologized for it. In 1956, he did get caught at a still when he was kind of mining the still one day and uh, spent time in prison. It kind of made him even more of a folk hero. Quite frankly, stock car racing really began with the moonshiners. NASCAR is loath nowadays to talk about the moonshine beginnings, but uh, that's where it started, and there's no denying it. They would take a Ford and put in it a Cadillac engine. They needed to have cars that were faster and more durable than the police. A 44 coupe with 25 cases of liquor in it is hard to handle. Normally, if you had a good car, He's a good driver, you didn't have any problem. Most of the first racers were, were moonshiners themselves because these were the guys who knew how to handle these cars at high speeds on dirt. Moonshine runners hauled bootleg hooch on country roads. The ability to handle a car on dirt was a necessity of the occupation. So was having a fast car and a heavy foot. On Sundays, they wouldn't run shine, but they had pretty fast cars. So they'd carve out what was called out in a farm field of a farm oval and uh, there'd be a lot of betting on the side and they would see if their bootleg car was faster without 500 gallons of moonshine in the trunk than the guy down the street or from the next holler. It's fun, it wasn't nothing that you're gonna make any money, it's just fun. The real heart and soul of the South got their chance and stock car racing was the platform that they got up on and they shouted to the world that not only are we as good as the plantation owners from the 19th century. We're better because we're real. This is one of the old roads that we all grew up on in the whiskey business. So you can imagine all in moonshine on, ain't no uh, forgiveness for uh, misjudging a turn or this little jig jag here, people wrecked on it all the time back in the old liquor days. Junior Johnson was a whiskey runner and a stock car hero, but he wasn't the first. The forefathers of the sport came from the generation prior from a generation weaned on the struggle to survive. The Depression hit harder and deeper in the South than anywhere else, and th they were really hard times. By simply the, the, the times they were living in, uh, everybody didn't finish high school. What are your alternatives? Either no job, a low-paying factory job, you know, trying to scratch out a living as a farmer, or you can make a ton of money as a bootlegger. Farming was what most people did. It was very, very difficult to get ahead at the end of the year. The one business that people could make serious money in was moonshining. I understand why they did it. They didn't do it to be bad guys or crooks. They did it to make, to make a living. It was a place where they weren't middle class. They weren't even blue collar. They had to make a stretch to make it to blue collar. A redneck is, is a guy with a redneck from the sun working in somebody else's field. And then, you know, during the weekend, he gets in a car, and he's the man, and he's tough, and he's in charge, and he has a chance to be somebody. Becoming, in a sense, night's jousting. These guys were tough guys that, that raced and did whatever they needed to do. And some of the things they'd sit out there at evening, pass a jug of moonshine around or something, and go race at night, have all the fun that race drivers had. 
The original men of stock car were born in the 30s, bootleg cowboys from down south. And the sport's first real pace setters were cousins from the hills of Georgia, Lloyd C., Roy Hall, and Raymond Parks. Raymond Parks is one of these characters who I think has never gotten the full credit that he deserves for being one of the true pioneers of stock car racing. Raymond was, was a successful moonshiner. He left home at 14 to, to become an, a moonshiner's apprentice. Um, in time, learned how to uh, you know, run his own moonshine business and made a ton of money doing that. This guy figured it out. He figured out if you hire the best mechanic and hire the best driver and you spend some money on your car, you win races. Raymond Parks was the Rick Hendrick of his time. He had superb race cars. He had a mechanic named Red Vote, And Red always said that the bootleggers always got the better equipment because they had a lot more cash to spend than the feds did. Raymond Parks then started financing the cars of a couple of his cousins who became a couple of the first stars of stock car racing, Lloyd C. and Roy Hall. There's no question about Lloyd C. He was the greatest driver that's ever been born. Lloyd C. was born and raised in and around Dawsonville, Georgia, um, one of the moonshining hubs of the 1920s and 30s. You know, it was a real struggling area, and, and so there was, a, there was a lot of crime. Everyone in, in his extended family was, was pretty familiar with the inside of the Dawson County Jail. His relationship with Raymond Parks kind of evolved to the point where Lloyd at a certain age started bugging Raymond to let him drive his whiskey cars for him. Lloyd learned how to make whiskey up in the hills, learned how to deliver it for, for his uncle Raymond, um, and, and then at some point transferred the driving skills over to the racetrack. Roy Hall also learned the moonshining business real young. By the time he was a teenager, he was, he was delivering moonshine. And then at some point, the two of them, Lloyd C. and Roy Hall, both cousins, start seeing more of each other now that they're driving. 1938 is when they started racing for their uncle, Raymond Parks. Fall of 1938, this first big race in Atlanta at Lakewood Speedway. It was enormously popular. They got over 20,000 people to that, that big race. Lloyd C., Roy Hall, a bunch of other moonshiners are in that race, and Lloyd C. wins that race. All three of these cousins caught the racing fever that day. In those days, the love affair with speed was more than a backwoods trend racing along the southern countryside. Spinning wheels, sliding through sharp-angled turns, were seen and heard across America. Hot rodding was born out on the West Coast. In the Northeast, uh, there was midget car racing, but a transition to a less costly form of racing, and all of a sudden, stock cars looked like that might be the way to go, because they could still run on the dirt tracks that dotted the, the country. It took a convergence uh, in Daytona Beach, Florida, for it all to finally take a national prominence. Bill France Sr. was a garage mechanic from Washington, D.C. And he was out of work. He had a young son and a wife. And he started to go south because he heard that there was work. He literally uh, drained his savings account of all $75 that were in it, bought some mechanics tools. He was going down to trying to find a place where it was relatively warm to work on cars. He figured he could work on cars in Florida as good as he could in Washington, D.C., so he went to Florida, and he found Daytona Beach and stayed there. Some call it the birthplace of speed, a flat stretch of sand, hard-packed. Natural proving ground, for going fast. There's some people had started a, a race on a beach course, one part beach, one part, part highway, and Bill Sr. decided, well, I think I can help. I think that he saw and had a great vision that America was ready for this, that it was ready to be thrilled. Big Bill France made his way to Daytona Beach in 1934, a destination known for smooth sand and land speed records. But stock car racing was something new to the shoreline, 
the people who ran the race were just a terrible at it. They didn't know how to sell tickets, didn't know how to organize it. The first two stock car races in Daytona were financial disasters. The city put on the first race in 1936 and lost $20,000. In 1936, 1937, the Elks Club put the 1937 race on and they lost money on that too. Part of the reason was they'd have a lot of cars, but whoever they hired to promote it would be often seen leaving in the midst of the race with a bag full of money and people wouldn't get paid and the spectators weren't protected. They were well below carnival barkers in terms of integrity. Bill France Sr. competed in some of these Daytona Beach Beach races, but he also had been burned by unscrupulous promoters. There was a fellow here in town named uh, Charlie Reese, and he had, he had some money, and he says, well, Bill, you know, you know racing, I've got some money, why don't we go ahead and try to put on the 38 race, we'll see what happens. When Bill France got a hold of this, he was seeing everybody was getting in for free, and now they were sneaking in, and he had no control over this big course two miles up the beach in uh, A1A. So he put a sign up in the center of it, and the sign up in the center of it said, beware rattlesnakes. And that's where the people were sneaking in, and so they finally, he sold tickets more that way. They split a $200 profit. He, he quickly realizes that, hey, if I double the uh, admission to the race from 50 cents to a dollar, we're drawing big enough crowds that we can, we can make a little money at this. Bill got the idea that he definitely had to run the race when it wasn't high tide. They would have to time the races with the tides. They would have to get the races in, in time, uh, before the tide came in, and not only to finish the race, but they, they had to get the people back into town. We start as early as 8 o'clock in the morning and as late as 4 o'clock in the afternoon because of the tide. Part sand and dune, part highway A1A. Racing Daytona Beach was a hazardous proposition, but there was a romance to the big race even then. The beach was what we look forward to going to every year and just enjoy yourself uh, being down on the beach and, and running on the sand. Some of the early races, we did not have windshield. We just had uh, a screen in front and we get our face full of dirt. People would run across the track. It was crazy. I mean, they had watched for it. And these cars, you know, were going extremely fast. And some of them would run across the track and the drivers would have to miss them, and I, it was crazy. Things often go wrong at the turns. You've got to be ready to jump. We'd go into the turns a little too fast, and we'd they'd get away from them. There was one driver that uh, was driving out his left window going up uh, north on the beach, and there was a family uh, with a couple of children on the bank. And he came down and he tossed it, and he ended up headed towards Daytona. <laughs> he missed the corner. The races at Daytona Beach became a popular game of pursuit, and Bill France saw value in the chase. I don't know how in the world he conducted races there as long as he did. You know, France decided, and he didn't tell anybody this, but the goal was that he would organize all of stock car racing in America in such a way that he would control it all. in the late 1930s and into 1940 and 41. The stock car racing community at that time was, was fairly small and, and, and pretty, pretty close-knit, so everybody knew everybody else. None of them made it their full-time job. Probably the closest were Bill France, Lloyd C. and Roy Hall. Bill France, you know, is driving all over the place on weekends to go to races in other states. You know, a little bit of a circuit begins to develop where they start traveling the circuit. Daytona had sand and surf, but the beach wasn't the only notorious stock car destination. Lakewood, Georgia, Langhorne, Pennsylvania, and each had its own fickle personality. Langhorne Speedway was a mile circle, and it had a, uh, they dumped oil on the track to keep it from uh, dust. 
racetrack was slick. You were almost in a constant slide all the way around the racetrack. You were almost out of control at any time. So if something happened in front of you, it was difficult to dodge it. Atlanta Lakewood Park is a stop on the major racing circuit. Drivers came from Indianapolis, they came from Chicago, came from Los Angeles. It would get very rough if you lost control. There was a lake on the inside that would catch you. See, I can't swim, and I was scared of the lake at Lakewood, you know. And uh, one race I was up there, I was leading the race, and my hood flew up, you know, and I couldn't see nothing. So I ended up in a pileup. But Lakewood was a pretty, pretty fast racetrack. As the summer of 1941 proceeds, Lloyd C., Roy Hall, and Bill France have all been champions of some sort. Lloyd C., the quietest of the three, starts to pull ahead of the other two and, and, and is winning more than the others. Lloyd C. surfaced as the driver to beat. But the growth of stock car racing didn't translate into money behind the wheel. The winner's purse for any of these races, it could be, you know, 50 bucks, 75 bucks. You know, they're not making enough to really call themselves full-time race car drivers yet. For the weekend racer, best way to make a buck was run and shine. It was all most drivers knew, Lloyd C. included. Lloyd won a lot of races uh, with these cars that they uh, would take from the racetrack and put whiskey in the trunk and deliver it on the way home. Man, they ran liquor out of those mountains in Georgia every day and every night into Atlanta. There's a lot of people live in Atlanta. Lloyd C. wins three straight races, High Point, North Carolina, Daytona Beach, Florida, and Atlanta, the old Lakewood Speedway mile track. Everybody figures, okay, he's got it wrapped up this year. You know, the biggest year of stock car racing, um, and Lloyd C. is gonna become its, its first big champ. Drives home to North Georgia. The next morning, he wakes up, there's a knock on the door, and it's his cousin Woodrow. They run a moonshine operation together, and he claims Lloyd hadn't paid him for his share of the load of sugar for making whiskey. And Woodrow says, let's go for a ride. Lloyd's brother decides to come with him. They stopped at a well along the way to put some water in a radiator, and uh, the cousin shot Lloyd C. and killed him right there on the spot. And he also shot his brother, but the brother lived. Lloyd utters his, his final two words, which are, tell Raymond, and he doesn't get to finished the sentence and lays his head back down and breathes his last breath and dies. He's 21 years old. He won more than half the races he entered. He had a Junior Johnson lifetime already behind him at the age of 21. Lloyd C. was the first Dale Earnhardt. He just never lived for the public to know who he was. That's the end of the life of the first real star of stock car racing. A couple months later, Pearl Harbor happens, and for stock car racing, the whole thing just grinds to a complete halt. Pearl Harbor, the nation thrust into World War. Drivers took up the cause abroad. The manufacturing of American cars was put up on blocks, and stock car racing was stuck in the garage. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. You know, a lot of these guys wonder what will happen to our sport when we come back, when this is all over. Will it, will it, you know, be there when we get back? Will people still be interested? I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. We won the war, and now, once again, they're making cars. Those cars came to represent something very important in America. Uh, the cars came to represent freedom. 
taste of adventure that a lot of these guys got during the war helped the sport of stock car racing when they came back. These were guys that were over in Europe or in the Pacific Theater, and they'd already been involved with death. They'd already seen what it could do. And they weren't going to go back to an everyday existence. They, they needed that thrill. Now all of a sudden, they're looking for things, you know, to, to keep that thrill level up a little bit. Well, the best way to do it was through auto racing. America watched her sons come home heroes. The horrors of war forged men of courage, eager to step into the fire and drive. The American people love heroes. We always have. Humphrey Wheeler once said it best. He said, all our fans want inside a race car is a hero. The car became the perfect setting. It's about human dreams and human hopes and aspirations and fears and taking chances. In 1947, stock car was back in the American conscious. But the races had no real direction. Well, Bill France had his own racing organization, but it was fairly regional. Bill was promoting a race at the old uh, Charlotte Speedway, and uh, he went in to tell the local sports editor that he had a national championship stock car race. It was going to pay a lot of money, more money than stock car races paid. The sports editor said, the national championship of what? You've got to have some events that comprise a championship series. He had staged a race in Lonsdale, Rhode Island in October of 1947. They, they packed Lonsdale with like 20,000 people on a half mile track. It was kind of like a, like a Bristol is today. And it really opened up Bill Francis' eyes as to what racing could be if everybody worked together. Not long after that, I think, they had the meeting at uh, the hotel in Daytona. Between October of 1947 and December of 47, he contacted all the best drivers, uh, promoters, car owners, mechanics, had them all come to Daytona for a four-day series of meetings at the Streamline Hotel. Part of the problem was that before that, each region had its own rules, each region had its own version of what you could do and couldn't do. And it took Bill France and a group of people to come together and create that environment where there was at least a certain level of uniformity of rules so that the guy from the West Coast could compete against the guy from the Northeast and they could do battle with the bootleggers down in the South. If you offer enough money, people will go in. Yeah, okay. That's what it is. I like the money. I like the money. Yeah, of course you like the money. But are you going to be gone? Are we you can advertise. Gone 30 in Any cars. kind of money. The oil companies, we get, we get uh, well. local dairy. Cleaners. December 1947. The Streamline Hotel, Daytona Beach. Bill France sat down with racing's driving forces. This whiskey-soaked gathering at a hotel bar would produce one of the most popular sports in America. Bill France Sr. was a man of vision. He was not easily intimidated. He was very creative. When he set his mind to something, he made sure it got done. He wasn't one to stand still. He liked to make things happen, and I asked what happened, you know. For that time and that era, someone had to be the voice of authority. Bill Sr. was able to do that. All right, guys, listen, let's get serious. The point I'm trying to make is, Nothing stands still in this world. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Things can only get better, worse, yeah. bigger, or smaller. Yeah. We have the ability to shape this thing. We have the ability to control it and make it what we want it to be. I mean, this was a meeting of some really unscrupulous characters. Very similar to what you might see on The Sopranos these days. There'll be a purse for each race. All around the country. Where are the poor guys? Because I remember there was an awful lot of arguments. Everybody had their idea how to do it. Well, yeah, but we want to control it. The whole point is to control it. These to make people, this is not their life, Bill. It's your life. It's not their life. They have jobs. Yeah, they have families. You want to go race out on a dirt track forever? You want to make this something They want really... to come out and have fun on a Sunday afternoon. Bill knew that he was going to have to take command. You guys that know me, you know that stock car racing is my entire life. I mean, it has been my whole life. 
But if we're gonna make this bigger and we're gonna make it better, I think it needs to be organized and, and I think we need to standardize it. Bill just kind of took everything into consideration and worked it out like more or less like he wanted it. We need to come up with some kind of a, a point system. That way, at the end of the season, the driver with the most points will get money out of a fund and this will keep the driver loyal to us. Do you think that'll work? Sure, yeah. Uh, when he spoke, everyone listened. He had a way of, when you talked to him, right or wrong, uh, if you thought you were, were right going in, you'd figure out that his ideas were really the way to go. So we need to establish another fund to help the drivers with their medical bills because we all know that this is one of the most dangerous sports around. We want to make sure not only do we cover the drivers, but we want to cover ourselves too. He had certain goals in mind. I mean, he wanted to set standards. We need to split the race up into three different divisions. We need the modified, roadsters, strictly stock cars. Every single one of these races needs to be run on a dirt track. The value system was being created, and really those same values are still important today. All right, guys, listen, we need to get this together. We need to come together and kind of think of a name for this organization. Right. Yeah, Anybody have any suggestions they want to throw out there? Something like the United States Stock Car Association or something like that. Major League Racing. Something with national in it. How about this? How about National Stock Car Racing Association? That's that's good. Good. I like that, Rich. It's that's not bad. Good. That's not bad. What do you that's think about that? Good. That's good. I like that. I like that. So hold the phone a second. Bill, you know uh, those boys down in uh, Georgia? Yeah. I was just down there a little while ago. I, I think they got that name already. N S C R A. You think no, or you're sure? Right. I'm, I'm about 100% sure. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm more than sure. I'm 100% right. sure. Okay. What about the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing? And we call it NASCAR. 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 All those in favor of NASCAR, NASCAR raise your hand. NASCAR. <laughs> and it's unanimous. NASCAR it is. All right. Yeah. We have a name. We got a name, boys. There we go. NASCAR. Oh, here you go. NASCAR. <laughs> The first NASCAR race was held uh, at Daytona Beach. Bill France had been running on the beach since 1936, and by 1948, the town fathers were sick of all the noise and all the smell of gas and oil, so he had to move south of Daytona Beach. The first sanctioned NASCAR race, and fittingly, a war vet would emerge. NASCAR's very first race, February of 1948 was won by Red Byron. He was a uh, war hero, and he also was a guy who had a leg injury and actually had to have his uh, uh, leg bolted to the clutch. He had come out of the war injured. You know, the left side of his body just full of shrapnel. Doctors suggest amputating his left leg, and he says, no way. He walked with this pronounced limp and had his leg brace and everything. Uh, his mechanic, Red Boat, uh, made a special clutch for him so that he could operate um, the race cars. He was a demon behind the wheel of a race car, and Raymond Parks owned this car. So for Raymond Parks, he's lost Floyd C. to, to murder, and so he needs somebody to race for him and decides to take a chance on Red Byron. It's NASCAR's first year, and you've got a really good storyline going. You know, if Bill France could have scripted it, I'm sure that's who we would have put in the in victory uh, lane that day, and that's what happened. At that time, there were a lot of other organizations competing to become the dominant force in stock car racing. And Bill France and, and the others who aligned with him really felt that NASCAR had the best chance. off the ground, they have this big historic race at Daytona Beach, and uh, and the guy who walks away with the victory is, is Red Byron. Well, at the time, I think the people that were involved didn't realize exactly what they were witnessing, but it was just a, a major, major milestone in automotive racing. Red Byron won the first official NASCAR race in the modified division. NASCAR's first strictly stock race wasn't run until June 1949. Jim Roper got the win, though Glenn Dunaway crossed the finish line first. After the race, Glenn was discovered to have had 
reinforced springs in the rear end of his car. Well, there was a logical reason for that. The car was a bootlegger car. When you've got illegal whiskey loading down the back of your car, you've got to have a little extra spring back there to go fast. Unfortunately, the name of the series was strictly stock, and the, those springs modified were, were illegal, so that Glenn Dunningway was thrown out as the winner of the race, and Jim Roper was awarded the victory. We built our own cars, so uh, they wouldn't need any part of it you didn't know about. And if you didn't do that, you just weren't competitive. In the 50s, Junior Johnson was a stock car Goliath, but he made his living running moonshine, a profession that landed him in lockup for an 11 month stint. In 1986, Johnson was granted a presidential pardon by Ronald Reagan. I was winning races and stuff back in the mid 50s, but uh, I wouldn't win no money. You know, it's more or less just so I won that race, and that's about the extent of it. I think it paid a thousand dollars for uh, you know a win in a race back in. Shucks, you'd make a thousand dollars in one night hauling whiskey. So if we'd have paid the taxes on the liquor, we you know could have made all we wanted to, but the taxes. Is, Oh, it was about $11 a gallon, I think it was. and you, you know, you could sell it for two or three dollars a gallon, and make a lot of money off from it. You know, if you didn't pay the taxes. Uh, it was a long, long time before I could afford to give up the moonshine business. Late, like 59, 60, it was more favorable to go driving a race car full time, and that's, that's what I did. At that time, NASCAR rolled in a whole new direction, and the sport would change forever. Bill France decided stock cars needed a bigger, better venue, and he wanted to build it in Daytona. Bill sent a letter to the city and said that unless some other facility could be uh, made available, he was going to have to withdraw from Daytona. Let's face it, they got sick of uh, you know, racing on the beach where they had to worry about what the tide was going to do, and he saw that uh, he could do something that had never been done before. France got his way and built his racetrack. Daytona International Speedway opened in 1959. He says, I made a lot of decisions in my life, but I have never made a decision that I didn't consider the best interest of NASCAR before I made that decision. Daytona was just this wall of asphalt. It was all about speed. A lot of these guys came from these short tracks. Up until then, drivers had never seen anything like that. 1959, we come through the tunnel and that looked like the biggest place in the world. The Daytona scared a lot of drivers. Scared a lot of drivers. I was scared. Not feared that I'd get hurt, but just, just not knowing what to expect. Well, it was so easy to drive. I could have smoked a cigarette and looked at the girls in the grandstand at 135 miles an hour. February 22nd, 1959, the Great American Race was born, and the inaugural Daytona 500 was decided by inches. Johnny Beauchamp had been dueling with uh, Lee Petty. They finally came down to the, uh, to the end. It was so close that you really had no idea. It was a photo finish. You couldn't have asked for a closer race. Bill France knew who the winner was. Well, he was smart. He called for all of the fans to send in any photographs. And he kept everybody in suspense. By a couple of inches, Lee Petty had won the race. Daytona got to be the thing, the place. It was really interesting that the racing started on the beach and then the transition 
um, to having a, a paved racetrack here and what my grandfather was able to do. That started the mystique. Uh, Bill took this unwelded dirt track sport that was extremely popular in the South, and he welded it into a organized a group of highly skilled, talented drivers. The first Daytona 500 was a harbinger. The landscape of stock car racing shifted fast. Asphalt, banked high and wide, was the new racing surface. In 1971, NASCAR took dirt tracks off the circuit completely. I always thought that, that the dirt driver was more of a pure race car driver than an asphalt driver. Dirt racing is about the driver. You know, you, you had to manhandle the car. I mean, you know, they didn't have anything close to power steering. They didn't have any of the good stuff that we have, uh, you know, at this day and time. The thing I like about dirt track racing more than anything is every time you go on the racetrack, it's dramatically different during an evening than, than it is, uh, you know, from session to session on a pavement track. The pavement stays the same. The toughness, the fights, the moonshine. Uh, the red clay, that's where this started. Anybody that sa says any different does, either wasn't there or is trying to camouflage history. It went from the dirt tracks where people went and got covered with cooking mud and dirt, where now you're paying $150, $200 to sit in the grandstands with 200,000 of your closest friends and watch these racers go 180 miles an hour for 500 miles. All of a sudden, it's a uh, billion dollar sport, uh, arguably the fastest growing sport in America. The right thing was done for the betterment of the sport was to move to other areas. And it is sad that that tradition has to go away, but still, Progress sometimes uh, dictates things that we don't like. The purest in the sport and the people who really followed the sport at the time screamed when they took the last dirt track off the schedule. And the sport flourished and moved forward and has grown to what it is today. The question is, is it a better sport because of that or is it a worse sport? And that's a question that everybody has to answer their own way.